Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ, Cardiology Theory Session 2. I hope that you guys enjoyed our free session so far. And this is also one of our first two weeks free session. We did a couple of classes so far. We finished Cardiology Theory Session 1 in our last class. That was just two days ago. I hope that you enjoyed that session. Tonight, we are going to finish cardiology. So we have left with some of the important topics like hypertension, cardiac failure, and some other topics which we are going to discuss. Do you guys have any questions in our last sessions? All right then, so we can start our session. So first of all, we are going to start with heart failure. To understand the heart failure, you need the pathophysiology of heart. As we have discussed in our first session, that how usually, cart, uh, how usually heart works. Let's have a look on this video again, just to wrap up the things in your head, okay? A healthy heart, as seen here, beats approximately 60 to 100 times a minute, providing oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. The lower left chamber of the heart, called the left ventricle, is the main pumping chamber. There are many different conditions that can lead to congestive heart failure, including a prior heart attack, high blood pressure, and coronary artery disease. Any of these can prevent the heart from efficiently pumping blood to the rest of the body. As a result, the heart may beat faster and the ventricle may increase in size, becoming an even less effective pump. When the kidneys sense the reduced blood flow, they attempt to compensate by retaining more water and salt. This excess fluid retention often causes congestion in the tissues and results in swelling and an increased strain on an already weak heart. The progressive effect of the heart failing to properly circulate blood and congestion due to fluid retention is known as congestive heart failure. All right, so this is a little bit of idea about congestive cardiac failure. And as you can see from the video that it means that when heart is unable to pump the blood to your body, there's the time we call it as heart failure, okay? Now we discussed about the, from where we, you guys need to read cardiology in our last session. So the important part where we are taking these notes are from your JM and also a little bit from your Kaplan step to CK. So let's start car congestive cardiac failure. So you have got a 60 year old man presenting to, your prim to the primary care physician for several months of dyspnea on exertion exercise intolerance, and lower extremity swelling. He has a past medical history of sarcoidosis. On physical exam, he has JVP elevated and also pitting edema in the lower extremities. You did an echocardiogram, which shows ejection fraction of 35%. So that's one of the question for heart failure. Heart failure patient will present to you with shortness of breath, and because of congestion, they can also develop some, some congestion in the whole body. Because of congestion in the, in the leg, patient will develop lower leg edema. Okay, If there is a congestion in the lung, patient will develop pulmonary edema. So we'll go through all of those one by one. These two are example of two type of heart failure. Let's have a look to the symptoms first, and then we will move forward. So what happens in heart failure? So if we know about the, the pathophysiology of the heart, we know that let's say this is your heart and your heart is supposed to send blood to the aorta and then to your whole body, right? Now, if heart is unable to do that properly, that's the time we call it as CCF. Now, heart failure can be due to 
two things. One, that it could be systolic heart failure. Another, it could be diastolic heart failure. You, rem you remember what is systole and diastole, right? So systole means con contraction of the left ventricle. And when it contracts, it can send the blood from left ventricle to the aorta. And the fraction of blood that can be sent to the aorta, that's what we call as ejection fraction. Now, if a patient having a trouble with this systolic movement of the heart or contraction of the heart, that's the time patient will develop heart failure. And that is what we will call as left-sided heart failure. Or you can also say systolic heart failure. Okay, now the other diagnosis is diastolic heart failure. In diastolic heart failure, patient will have difficulty with the relaxation of the heart. Now, if your heart is not able to relax, it does not get enough blood. If it does not get enough blood, it cannot pump a lot of blood out. And that is what we call as diastolic heart failure. So one is systolic heart failure and another is diastolic heart failure. Now in heart failure, let's say, because of heart is not pumping enough blood to the body, there will be accumulation of blood in the left ventricle, right? Now, at one time, left ventricle will be full. So there will be backflow of blood to left atrium. And you remember that from lungs, through the pulmonary vein, the blood will come to left atrium, right? That is the, that is the thing. Now, at one time of heart failure, left atrium will get full with blood. And then there will be backflow of blood to the pulmonary vein, and that will cause accumulation of fluid in the lung. So this is all because of backflow. So from first, left ventricle gets ill, then left atrium gets full, and then pulmonary vein gets congested, and then pulmonary edema happens because of excess fluid in the lung. When there will be excess fluid in the lung, what will happen? Because you remember other thing that from right ventricle, pulmonary artery is supposed to send blood to the lungs, right? Now, now the lung is already congested with a lot of fluid. So what will happen? The pulmonary artery then get congested. And when there will, there will be a lot of blood flow in pulmonary artery, that is what we call as pulmonary hypertension. Once pulmonary hypertension happens, there is a lot of pressure in this artery now. So when, think about that, when you have a lot of pressures in here, if your right ventricle needs to send blood to your pulmonary artery, it will need to work a lot because there is a lot of pressure here. Now, against that pressure, if you need to send blood, you need to work hard. So right, right ventricle then start to work hard and at some stage, it becomes right ventricular hypertrophy. And at some stage, right ventricle also fails. That is what we will call as right heart failure. So when right, right ventricle fails, it will get ac accumulated with blood. Then right atrium will get accumulated with blood. Now you remember that from superior vena cava, blood was supposed to come from the upper extremities. And from inferior vena cava, blood was supposed to come from the lower extremities. Now that when the right atrium gets full with blood, now there will be overflow of blood in the vena cavers. And that is what you will get as raised JVP and pitting edema in the lower legs. Because of congestion in the hepatic vein, patient will also develop hepatic congestion and it will cause tender hepatomegaly. So, raised JVP, tender hepatomegaly, and pitting edema. This three is the main feature of right heart failure. And the feature of left heart failure is mainly pulmonary edema, which mainly if you have a lot of fluid accumulated in the lung, patient will develop dyspnea, especially while lying down during sleeping. The so patient will come to you that I get worsening of my shortness of breath when lying. Sometimes they will wake up in the middle of the night, catching up for, for breath. And that is what we call as 
paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So PND is a feature. Now, because of excess accumulation of fluid in the lung, patient will also have bivasic articulation. So all of these are features of left ventricular failure, especially bivasic articulation. Then you have orthopnea, which is when patient lie down, the breathing difficulty get worse. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Sometimes you can get S3 gallop rhythm. So all of these are features of your left ventricular failure. Is this clear for everyone, guys? Did you guys get the pathophysiology of how this usually happens? Because if you understand this topic, heart failure is very easy for you. Good, very good. Now, because of fluid accumulation, what symptoms a patient of heart failure will have? So we know that patient will come to you with shortness of breath and orthopnea. Because of, because of lung, lung fluid accumulation, they also get a dry, irritating cough, get worse at night, fatigue, lethargy. Because of fluid accumulation, weight gain will happen, pedal edema, and abdominal discomfort because of hepatic congestion. So those are common symptoms because of congestion. Now, as heart is not pumping enough blood, because of poor cardiac output, patient also get dizzy as well, weakness and fatigue. Okay, now left heart failure, these are the main feature as we discussed, it can give you a tachycardia, tachypnea, laterally displaced apex pit, bivasilar repetition, gallop rhythm, and poor peripheral perfusion. But these are the main two findings, bivasilar and gallop rhythm. Right heart failure, we know that elevated JBP, ankle edema, and tender hepatomegaly. Now there is a video here, which will show that what is systolic and diastolic heart failure. Just go through it in your own time. So, what is the difference between a systolic and diastolic heart failure? The classic heart failure is systolic failure because of inadequate pumping of the heart. So that's the classic one or commonest one, systolic heart failure, where heart is not able to pump the blood. When heart is not able to pump the blood, what happens? The ventricle gets dilated and it, it's unable to contract poorly. If it cannot contract, what will happen to the ejection fraction? Because ejection fraction depends on the cardiac output. If your heart is not pumping, cardiac output will be reduced. Obviously, your ejection fraction will be reduced. In a normal person, 35 to 45 is usual ejection fraction, sometimes even up to 60. Okay, But less than 35 is what we call as possible heart failure. Okay. Diastolic heart failure, on the other hand, it is due to impairment of left ventricular feeling. That means in this case, heart is unable to get relaxed. So that's called diastolic heart failure. But there is no problem with the systole. That means heart can pump blood, but the problem is that it cannot get relaxed. If it cannot get relaxed, it has lower cardiac output anyway. A substantial proportion of the heart failure are due to diastolic heart failure, and that is impaired ventricular relaxation. Especially, you should suspect it in an elderly patient with hypertension, but a normal heart size on chest X-ray who present with heart failure symptom. And many patients can have both systolic and diastolic at the same time. So that's what we have written in here, systolic dysfunction, means loss of contractile strength of the myocardium and that result in decrease in normal ventricular emptying causing ejection fraction less than 45. The example of systolic heart failure include ischemic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. This diastolic heart failure known as heart failure with 
preserved ejection fraction. Many times you will see this abbreviation when you are working in hospital. So that is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which means in diastolic heart failure, ejection fraction is fine, but the feeling of ventricle is impaired. So the, if you do an echocardiogram, that will be basically normal. So what are the causes of heart failure? We already know that it is divided into systolic and diastolic, and the diagnosis can only be made by an echocardiogram of the heart. So if you want to know what type of heart failure it is, you have to do an echo. The causes of systolic heart failure, most of the time it's due to ischemic heart disease, including previous myocardial infarction. And sometimes hypertension can be the cause. Whereas diastolic heart failure can be due to obesity, hypertension, diabetes. Again, it can be due to ischemic heart disease, hypertension, aortic stenosis, atrial fibrillation, and all of it. Now, you don't need to remember that. So now that you know about systolic and diastolic heart failure, what are the investigations that we can do to diagnose heart failure? If any time a question gives you that features of heart failure, whatever it is, if they ask you what is the initial or what is the next most appropriate investigation, what are you going to do? First is always ECG. You would never send a patient for an echocardiogram without having a baseline ECG done first. So just think in that way. They can give you heart failure symptom and stem, but they ask you what is the next most appropriate investigation. That will be always ECG. But if they ask you the definitive investigation, that is your echocardiogram. What else we can do? We can do chest X-ray. Sometimes in systolic heart failure, it can show cardiomegaly. There are a lot of things can be there, but it's not very important. There is another test called B-type natriuretic peptide. In short form, it is called BNP. Now BNP, it's, it's not a very, it's not done for diagnostic purpose, but it is mainly done to assess the severity and prognosis of heart failure. So if you have got a patient who already been diagnosed with heart failure, now getting frequent congestive shock problem, and then you want to know the severity of it, then you can do the BNP. Always remember, if echocardiogram is unavailable in your area, then BNP is another alternative. It can help with your diagnosis, but we don't do it for diagnosis, we do it for prognosis. So echocardiogram is the test of choice to confirm the diagnosis. And also it can classify the difference between systolic and diastolic heart failure. Now, after investigation, let's come to the management. So in heart failure, the first line management for systolic heart failure is ACE inhibitor or ARVs. Plus, you can add medications depending on how bad it is. You can add a frusemide. Only time we add frusemide in a heart failure patient, if the patient having active congestion, like severe breathing difficulty because of pulmonary edema, that's usually the time you put the patient on frusemide. Otherwise, even if there is a little bit of ankle edema, you would not put them on frusemide. Okay, so the first line medication is ACE inhibitor or ARB, plus frusemide if congestion, with ACE inhibitor, this is a good addition is spironolactam. Now let's say still patient is having congestion, even after using all the three, you can add a selective beta blocker. And the last option is digoxin. We don't, we don't use digoxin any, any longer because digoxin has a lot of side effect. So we put the digoxin at, at our last resort. Okay, so we have got 
ACE inhibitor plus fusamide plus spironolactam plus a selective beta blocker and stoxin. Okay. Now, another important thing to remember that the beta blocker that you use in heart failure, you should only use beta blocker if a patient is euvolemic. That means heart failure now well controlled. In an uncontrolled heart failure patient, we don't use beta blocker. Okay, so remember that. So that's the step-by-step -step approach that we have discussed. So you can see here, among all the medication for heart failure, along with ACE inhibitor, beta blockers have been demonstrated to decrease mortality. So if they ask you which medication has mortality benefit in heart failure, only three medication has mortality benefit. One is ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and spironolactone. But we only use the beta blocker after stabilization of the symptom with diuretic and ACE inhibitor. Okay, so you start patient on beta blocker after stabilization of symptom with diuretic and ACE inhibitor. So that's the management of systolic heart failure. Now, nowadays, yes, there is a place of triflozin, which is your SGLT2 inhibitor. In heart failure, you can use that empagliflozin. That's the SGLT2. SGLT2 is mainly used for diabetes, but empagliflozin, or just remember as a glyflozins, can be added, but not as a first line. You will obviously start with ACE inhibitor and spironolactone first, and then your beta blocker. Now, before adding digoxin, you can try this empagliflozin. Okay, this is known as EMPA. Let me write it here so that you understand. Okay, so that can be used in heart failure patient as well. Sometimes we all also use evabradin. Evabradin, evabradin is another medication which can be used in a heart failure patient, especially if the, if the ejection fraction becomes less than 35, okay? Now, other one, the last option or the best option for an uncontrolled hypertensive, uncontrolled heart failure patient is known as Enpresto. These are all new medication in the market. You don't need to know a lot about it, but just get an idea, at least know the name of it. So these are all the newer heart failure medications which we use in Australia, but these are not even in your jam. It's just in, in the Australian guidelines, okay? So you have got empagliflozins, which is that SGLT2 inhibitor. You have got, the other option is evabradin, which usually given if ejection fraction comes below 35, and last option for uncontrolled one is Entresto. So digoxin, nowadays even, we, we, we don't usually use digoxin un, unless there is no other option. Moving on to diastolic heart failure. The diastolic heart failure management depends on the cause of it. So for a hypertensive patient, ischemic heart disease or diabetic patient. So these are common patients who can develop diastolic heart failure. Now, the problem is important to understand. You have got a patient who can't relax the heart. So what you will have to do for it? You'll have to give something which can help the heart to get relaxed. Okay, so what can make the heart less active? So if you give them some ionotropic agent, especially beta blocker or rate limiting calcium channel blocker that will reduce the heart rate. If heart rate is reduced, contraction of the heart will be reduced. In that case, the heart will get enough time to get relaxed. 
So for diastolic heart failure, the treatment is totally different. So you give calcium channel blocker or beta blocker for this patient. Try to avoid anything which can cause hypovolemia. Because in these patients, patient is already not getting enough blood in the heart. So if you give diuretics, then patient will lose more fluid from the body and that can make it worse. So in diastolic heart failure, we try to avoid any diuretics, digoxin, even some nitrate or vasodilator. So that's your diastolic heart failure management. Now moving on to congestive cardiac failure causing pulmonary edema. Now pulmonary edema, sometimes patient can come to you with an acute pulmonary edema due to left ventricular failure. So due to left ventricular failure, the lung can get totally congested with fluid and patient can develop acute left ventricular failure. And those patient comes to you with a very severe difficulty breathing, oxygen saturation going down, so, and bivasilar crepitations are there. So that's what you will think about pulmonary edema at that time. In pulmonary edema, you get some finding on the chest X-ray. We will come to that X-ray very soon. Now, what are the commonly used diuretics that you use in heart failure patient? The medication is important for exam, especially for their side effect. So common one is thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics has a lot of side effect as well. So it can cause hyponatremia, hypokalemia, but it can increase the calcium. It can cause increased uric acid, which means it can aggravate gout. It can cause egg granular cytosis, and also it can increase the possibility of hyperglycemia. So glucose intolerance can be there. So thiazide has a lot of side effects. So sodium potassium can go down, calcium can go up, uric acid can go up, egg granulocytosis and glucose intolerance. More or less similar like thiazide diuretics is indapamide. It also gives you more or less similar side effect, but indapamide is notorious to cause hyponatremia. Then we have loop diuretics. The common loop diuretics that we use is frusemide. It can cause all type of electrolyte abnormality. So hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, all of this can happen. But frusemide has some notorious side effect, like it can cause autotoxicity, it can cause interstitial nephritis. So remember these two. And then we have a potassium sparing diuretic, which is a spironolactone which can increase the potassium in your body. And spironolactone is very notorious to cause gynecomastia. Okay, so these are the side effects that comes in exam in many ways. Now coming to digoxin, or also known as digitalis. Now, because it is not very commonly used anymore in, in Australia, you don't need to go through a lot about it. So it is now it is at the last kind of resort for treating heart failure. The problem with digoxin is that digoxin compete with the potassium to go inside the cardiac cell. Okay. Now, if there is hyperkalemia, so if there is increased potassium in the interstitial fluid, more and more, more and more potassium will be able to go inside the cardiac muscle. And digitalis or digoxin will not get enough space to go in. So if there is a hyperkalemia, so increased potassium can reduce the digitalis activity. Whereas if it's hypokalemia, so if your, if your interstitial fluid has low potassium, at that time, digoxin will, will be able to get into the cell more easily. 
and it can increase the digoxin toxicity chance. So that's what you need to remember. Like, let's say, if this is your one of the heart cell, both digoxin and potassium use the same receptor to go inside the cell. If digoxin is, if let's say, if potassium is higher than normal, or if potassium is higher than digoxin, then more and more potassium will go in. So that will reduce the effect of digitalis. But if potassium is low, more and more digitalis will go in and it will have a chance of causing digoxin toxicity. So the point is hypokalemia can cause digoxin toxicity. What are the toxic effect of digitalis or digoxin? The commonest side effect is nausea and vomiting. Some other features could be patient can have bloody vision, yellow halo around the object, and almost any kind of arrhythmia can be due to digoxin. But the commonest one is paroxysmal atrial tachycardia and premature ventricular complex. So PVC and PAT, these are the common arrhythmia caused by digoxin. If you suspect a patient to have digoxin toxicity, what you should do? Immediately stop the digoxin. You can do the blood digoxin level. Sometimes even digoxin level is normal. Patient can develop toxicity. Other than that, if patient having any kind of arrhythmia, then you can give them lidocaine. But for antidote of digoxin, you can use DG bind. So the antidote is called DG bind. All right. Now there is one other thing. If a patient having a ejection, persistent ejection fraction less than 35 with dilated cardiomyopathy, that patient can be a good candidate for a medical device, which we call automatic implantable cardioverter and defibrillator. So this is a standard therapy for dilated cardiomyopathy because patient with dilated cardiomyopathy with a less than 35% 35 35 ejection fraction has a very high chance of a sudden cardiac death. So to prevent that, it's a good idea to pay, put the patient on this device. Okay. So this was the X-ray I was talking about for pulmonary edema. Any pulmonary edema needs to be hospitalized because this can result in respiratory failure. If you look at here, the X-ray will look like bilateral congestion and it, it looks like a bad wing appearance. If you look at this one, see that the patient having bilateral interstitial shadow, right? And a kind of a whitish shadow. So that is what we call as bat wing appearance, which can be found in pulmonary edema patient. So for pulmonary edema patient, they will have increased shortness of breath, respiratory rate will go high, Patient can have cyanosis, bivisular cupidation, all the bad finding. The treatment is admission to the hospital, oxygen, and put the patient in a propped up position, give them diuretic. Sometimes we also give them morphine because morphine can reduce the anxiety of the patient. Sitting the patient upright, that's the first thing that we do, propped up position followed by oxygen. Okay. That will be the, the first management. Then you can give the management accordingly. Like but the first thing is diuretic in this case. So for pulmonary edema, admission, propped up position, oxygen if needed, followed by diuretics. And what diuretic? Frusamide. All right. So that must be everything about heart failure, guys. Any question? Did you guys get everything that I discussed?
main investigation is echocardiogram. Great. Now, moving on to the next topic, valvular heart disease. Effect of digoxin with normal level of potassium. With a normal level of potassium, there is not much of the effect, then digoxin and potassium will, will be, they will just go in based on, the, based on the interstitial fluid concentration. So if there is a normal potassium, then there is a less chance of having a digoxin toxicity. And digoxin toxicity does not depend on level of potassium only, it depends on a lot of other factors also. Like if you have a renal failure, there is increased risk of digoxin toxicity. If you are on a certain other medication, it can increase the effect of digoxin. So a lot of other factors work in this case. Valvular heart disease. Now, for valvular heart disease, it is very important for exam, especially the type of murmur. Now, you all remember that remembering murmur is one of the hardest thing, right? But I can show you a good formula, and if you can keep it in your head, it will become much easier, okay? But anyhow, you might need to memorize a little bit because there is no, no good way to remember it. So, you remember that your heart has four valves, right? So in between right and left atrium, right and right atrium and right ventricle, you have got tricuspid valve. Then right ventricle through the lungs, you have got pulmonary valve. You have got aortic valve here and mitral valve, right? These are the four main valves of your heart. Tricuspid and pulmonary valve, it's not very important for exam. The important one is mitral and aortic valve. So we are mainly focusing on these two. You have to remember only one murmur and you can use that for almost any other. So MS murmur. So we all know the mitral stenosis murmur, which is a mid diastolic murmur. Right? And it is any mitral murmur is based hard at apex. If you can remember the mid diastolic murmur of MS, you can remember all other three murmur. Now, what is murmur, by the way? Murmur is the increased flow of blood through this valve, either due to a narrowed valve or a weak valve causing regurgitation of the blood. So either it's a stenosis or regurgitation. So mitral stenosis gives you mid diastolic murmur. Always think about what is, what is the opposite of MS. So in by opposite, you remember aortic. So we, we, we will think opposite of mitral is aortic. What is the opposite of systolic? Regurgitation. So if you remember in this way, it becomes very easy. So now, what is opposite of mitral stenosis? So mitral opposite is aortic, and stenosis opposite is regurgitation. So aortic regurgitation also gives you diastolic murmur. And what kind of diastolic murmur it gives? It gives you early diastolic murmur. And aortic regurgitation murmur is best heard at the left fourth intercostal space. Now that we know about this valve, the position of the valve is also an important thing to remember. The position of the valves that we say that if this is your intercostal space, that's your right and that's the left. Let's say this is second, heart, fourth, and fifth. Let's say this is the apex of the heart.
At the apex, mitral murmurs are based hard, so which is around fifth intercostal space. Then around right fourth intercostal space, so this one gives you tricuspid valve. Left fourth intercostal space, usual for aortic regurgitation, sometimes even tricuspid tricuspid murmur comes to the left, left fourth intercostal. So it's in between. But aortic regurgitation, the murmur is basically at left fourth intercostal space. But the tricky thing is the aortic valve is actually here, right second intercostal space. And left second intercostal space is the position for pulmonary valve. Now you might be thinking that aorta comes from left side while we are talking about the right side. So aorta comes like this. So that's why it goes to the right and just bent like this. And pulmonary artery goes like this, okay? So that's why you are getting pulmonary murmur in the right, in the left second intercostal space and aortic murmur in the right second intercostal space. So if I write it here, pulmonary murmur. Left second intercostal space is the place. And aortic murmur, usually it should be left second, sorry, right second intercostal space. Okay, so pulmonary murmur in the left and aortic murmur in the right second intercostal space. That's the usual valve place. But just for the aortic regurgitation, just you have to remember that, that it is best hard in the left fourth intercostal space. So far, is it clear? Great. Now, moving on to others. Now, we know about MS and AR. What about other two? So, we are left with MR, right? Because MS is already done, so mitral regurgitation, and we are left with aortic stenosis. So, these two will be systolic murmur. What kind of systolic murmur? AS systolic murmur is called ejection systolic murmur. And MR gives you pan systolic murmur or hollow systolic murmur. Okay. So if you can remember the mitral stenosis murmur, mid diastolic murmur in the left fifth intercostal space, which is the place of your apex, then you can remember all these four. So mitral stenosis, what is the opposite of mitral aortic? What is the opposite of systole? Regurgitation. So aortic regurgitation also give you diastolic murmur. What kind of diastolic murmur? Early diastolic murmur. Where is the place of aortic regurgitation? Left fourth intercostal space. Now we are left with MR and AS. Both will be systolic murmur. You just need to remember that AS gives you ejection systolic murmur and MR gives pan-systolic murmur. Now the position, mitral based hard at apex. Aortic stenosis, now this will be based hard in this right second intercostal space. Okay, now both of these two murmur radiates. Mitral regurgitation murmur radiates to axilla, Aortic stenosis murmur radius to your neck or carotid. All right. Now, that's actually the most important four murmur that usually comes in exam. If you even know about this four murmur, you can easily exclude the other options as well. So this is one of my formula to remember. Now people, everyone has different kind of formula. If you have a better one, you can use that. But I feel like this is, this is how I will not make any mistake, okay? 
And this is how if you can just grab this formula in your head once, it becomes so easy. Did you guys get it? Any question? So any mitral murmur, the position will be in apex. And where is your apex? Left fifth intercostal space. Yes, so that's good. Dr. Naomi, you, did you understand? Yeah, good. Okay. Anyone having any questions? Do you think it's something which you can remember? So AM means aortic murmur, you are asking Dr. Akash? Dr. Akash, are you asking about aortic murmur, both aortic regurgitation and stenosis? Yeah, so the thing is that aortic regurgitation murmur, you will get best, best hard in the, and I think like you guys having a little bit difficulty with the positioning, right? So if we see here in a bigger picture, so that's your right and that's the left. So let's say if this is second, third, fourth, and fifth. So the position of mitral marmor is the left fifth intercostal space, usually around this area. Now, position of pulmonary murmur, because pulmonary murmur or pulmonary valve usually goes like this. So if we use another pen, so pulmonary murmur will go like this. So the murmur of pulmonary valve will be best heard in the left second intercostal space along the sternal A's. So this is, if this is the sternum, along the sternal A's, it will be best heart. If we talk about aortic murmur, it goes like this. So aortic murmur is best heart in the right second intercostal space but only difference is aortic regurgitation murmur, which is best heard in the left fourth intercostal space. So that's why it's a little different. Aortic stenosis murmur, best heard in the right second intercostal space, which is here. Aortic regurgitation murmur, best heard in the left fourth intercostal space. And the tricuspid murmur, it's sometimes in the left, sometimes in the right, fourth intercostal space. So most of the time, left fourth intercostal space is the, is the area of tricuspid valve. Tricuspid is very unusual to get in the exams, forget about it. Even pulmonary does not come. Aortic and mitral is the usual one that comes in exam. Okay, clear for everyone? 
Now, if you go through this med bullet, it has discussion about this heart murmur in details. So this guideline as well. So that's what we have written in here. If you see that aortic stenosis murmur, it's a loud murmur. And the murmur is ejection systolic murmur in the right second intercostal space. And a stenosis murmur can radiate to the neck or carotid. Mitral regurgitation murmur is a hollow systolic murmur at apex radiating to axilla. Tricuspid also hollow systolic. Then we have aortic regurgitation, which is a high pitched early diastolic murmur at the left sternal border. And this is actually left fourth sternal border. Mitral stenosis is a rumbling mid diastolic murmur. Okay. So these are the main ones that you need to remember. And Dr. Aklima. In diastolic heart failure, when should we start drug? After doing echo? Yes, if, if patient is symptomatic, then only we, we start treatment. You don't need to treat everyone with calcium channel blocker or beta blocker. Especially if, you, if the patient having symptoms of heart failure, then only you can start. And uh, this is the med bullet. Let me share it. So I have shared the med bullet guideline in your chat box. Okay, all good then. So that's all about this heart failure and valvular heart disease. So let us take a five minute break. And after that, we will start with some cardiomyopathy and all other important topics. Okay, so let's take a five minute break and just think about what you have learned so far. Thank you, five minute break guys.
All right, everyone, let's just start again. Okay, so we are going to discuss now about cardiomyopathy. There are three kinds of cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy means when the heart muscle having the main problem. And when you talk about heart muscle, you are mainly focusing on the left ventricle because that's the main part of the heart, which is supposed to squeeze and, and send the blood to your body. So the first one that we are going to discuss is dilated or congestive cardiomyopathy. What happens in dilated cardiomyopathy that there will be diminished myocardial contractility. In dilated cardiomyopathy, the heart usually gets dilated like this. This is the normal heart. So it has a, you can see the left ventricular muscle has got both thickness, enough thickness. But when it gets dilated, the thickness gets reduced. And when thickness gets reduced, the power of contractility gets reduced because it gets too much dilated. So when you get too much dilated, the power of contraction gets reduced. Now, if your power of contraction gets reduced, what kind of heart failure you will get? Systolic or diastolic? Guys? Systolic, right? Very good. So dilated cardiomyopathy will give you systolic heart failure. And this is one of the most common cause of heart transplant. Most common cause is unknown, but alcohol can cause it and some other toxin can cause it. You don't need to know the cause. The symptoms will be typical of heart failure, but mostly due to systolic dysfunction. So if you do the echocardiogram, you will find out the ejection fraction is less than 35 or usually less than 45. Like normally we say that above 45 is fine. Less than 45 becomes heart failure. In a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, the treatment will be exactly same like how you treat systolic heart failure. So how we treat systolic heart failure, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, diuretics, that's the same treatment. If a patient has dilated cardiomyopathy and ejection fraction is than 35, then implantable defibrillator will reduce the sudden cardiac death. Okay. The next one is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Very important topic for the exam. So HOCM, it can happen without any known hereditary problem, but in 60% cases, it can be transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait. So family history can be an important factor here. The hallmark of this condition is that the, in here, the myocardium will get hypertrophied as well as the interventricular septum that will get hypertrophied as well. So if you look at here, this is the normal heart. Look at the interventricular septum. It's good, right? But if you look at here, you can see the whole myocardium has got hypertrophied, but the septum has got more hypertrophied. So sometimes what can happen that if the septum get hypertrophied like this, it can reduce the cardiac output because it blocks this area where blood can go from left ventricle to aorta. You can also see the compliance of blood is very, very much reduced here. So there is not enough space for the heart to get filled up. So when your heart cannot get filled up with blood, what kind of heart failure you get? diastolic heart failure, right? So that is exactly what you are going to get here. Because of hypertrophy, left ventricular compliance is reduced, but systolic performance is not problem. Diastolic dysfunction is characteristic, which will cause diastolic heart failure. Because the muscle is very strong, heart can contract very easily. And sometimes heart contract more than usual. 
So you can get like a very higher ejection fraction in this patient. Sometimes even ejection fraction 80 to 90 percent. Okay. So that's what is one of the other feature you can get here. The symptoms will be same like heart failure. You can get some other finding like bifid carotid pulse. You can get S4 gallop rhythm. You can get systolic murmur or mitral regurgitation murmur in here. Not too much important about the murmur, but one of the important thing that HOCM can give you the same murmur like aortic stenosis. So remember the aortic stenosis murmur, which, which is commonly found in the right second intercostal space, and it's the ejection systolic murmur. HOCM can also give you same ejection systolic murmur, but it is commonly found in the left fourth intercostal space. Okay, so that's common. Sometimes it can give you mitral regurgitation murmur as well. Now, if a patient coming to you with a possible feature of HOCM, especially what you will get, that patient will come to you with a sudden onset of loss of consciousness while playing football. And then suddenly he came, came, came back to normal without any, any other confusion or dizziness. And you have got, a, like that patient has got a family history of sudden cardiac death. So that's the time you might be thinking about possibility of HOCM. If they ask you, what is your next investigation? The next investigation always in cardiology is ECG. Okay, so first you do the ECG. ECG sometimes can be normal, sometimes can show left ventricular hypertrophy. But the main diagnostic investigation is echocardiogram. If you do an echocardiogram, then you can get all these findings. Sometimes, if you do a resting echocardiogram, it can be normal. So if you're suspicious of HOCM, then if resting echo is normal, the last option is to do a stress echocardiogram. And if a stress echocardiogram is normal, then you can rule that out. So remember that because it comes in exam in a lot of ways. Now, let's say you have, you know about this is a HUCOM patient or HOCM patient. You know it is a diastolic heart failure. So how you are going to treat it? Same like your diastolic heart failure, which is either with beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. And what you are going to avoid? Anything which can reduce the blood volume, like diuretics, digoxin, any vasodilators. Okay? So that's the treatment. See that if you know the pathophysiology, it's actually very interesting and very easy. You don't need to memorize anything. The next is restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is usually very rare and is the least common cause of cardiomyopathy. In this case, the myocardium becomes rigid. And if it's rigid, if it, can, if it does not contract or relax, what will happen? Heart cannot get Heart cannot squeeze, heart cannot relax. So in this case, the myocardium is rigid and non-compliant and impeding the ventricular feeling and raising the cardiac feeling pressure from abnormal diastolic function. Sometimes systolic performance often reduced. So in this case, you can get both systolic and diastolic heart failure. But the initial thing is diastolic heart failure because for your heart to feel, your heart, the left ventricle needs to relax. But if this wall is very rigid and stiff, it will not get relaxed. So initially diastolic dysfunction and then systolic dysfunction will be also there because heart cannot contract as well. And the future will be same of congestive cardiac failure. The same first ECG, then echocardiogram, there is no good treatment for it. Usually patient dies from heart failure or arrhythmia. And the only curative treatment is heart transplantation. So that's all about your cardiomyopathy. 
Moving on to next topic, acute pericarditis. You remember a little bit of acute pericarditis from our last session. So it's the inflammation of the outer layer of the heart, which is pericardium. The common cause is idiopathy. We don't know what is the cause. But then viral infection is a, also very important. Sometimes connective tissue disorder like SLE can come as a pericarditis. Some patient can have neoplasm. Some can have uremic pericarditis, like a patient with renal failure. If they complain of chest pain, characteristic of pericarditis, think about possibility of pericarditis. So uremia can cause pericarditis, especially in end stage renal failure. And you remember that the pain will be substernal or left-sided, and it will get worse with lying down and better with leaning forward. And it will be a kind of like a stabbing pain. If you do auscultation, you can get a pericardial friction rub in here. If investigation comes, initially is ECG, and then you can do an echocardiogram. Treatment is basically just rest. You can give them some anti-inflammatory like NSAID. If NSAID does not help, then steroid. Sometimes if it is like a very resistant pericarditis, you can add colchicine to that. Okay. Now we all know about pericarditis from our last session. So move on to pericardial effusion. So pericardial effusion means, just like pleural effusion, pericardial effusion is fluid accumulation in the pericardial cavity. So if this is your heart, and this is the pericardium, if there is a fluid collection in here, that is what we will call as pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion, the fluid can be transudative or exudative. The transudative causes are mainly due to congestive cardiac failure, overhydration, or hypoproteinemia. If it is exudative, it suggests possibility of a cardiac injury. Sometimes it can be found in neoplastic disease like cancer or tuberculosis. It's not very important for exam, so don't bother too much. The important thing is when fluid accumulates slowly, the pericardium expand to accommodate the fluid. So pericardium will try to ac accommodate as much fluid as possible. But when fluid accumulates rapidly and pericardium, pericardium cannot accommodate too much blood, then what will happen? It will put pressure on the heart. And if it puts pressure on the heart, heart is not able to relax. So it will inhibit cardiac feeling. And that can result in a acute heart failure. And that is what we call as cardiac tamponade. So cardiac tamponade is an emergency thing. If you are confused or if you want to confirm the diagnosis of pericardial effusion, the confirmatory is echocardiogram. Initially, you can do a chest X-ray. If you do a chest X-ray, will, you will get a water bottle-like appearance like this. So see that how much enlarged it is. It is pericardial effusion. Now, cardiac tamponade can become life-threatening because it, the fluid effusion develops so rapidly that heart gets compressed. And patient will present to you with an acute heart failure symptom like severe shortness of breath, orthopnea. They can get pulses, paradoxes. JVP will be raised. Even patient get into shock. Now, there is a triad of acute tamponade that you should remember called Beck's triad. So patient will come to you with features of heart failure. And when you examine them, if you get low blood pressure, like hypotension, raised JVP, and decreased heart sound. Classic picture is written as a muffled heart sound. So anytime there is a muffled heart sound, patient getting into hypotension, features of heart failure, raised JVP, think about possibility of cardiac tamponade. So the main clue to the diagnosis will be this decreased heart sound or muffled heart sound. 
immediately do a bedside echocardiogram. And if you confirm the diagnosis, you can do a pericardiosynthesis. So you just insert a large bore needle in the pericardial cavity and bring out all the fluid that has accumulated. And that can save the patient life. Okay, so that's what we will call as cardiac tamponet. Moving on to constrictive pericarditis. Not very important, but just have an idea. So constrictive pericarditis, it's the thickening of the pericardium, especially if there was a previous inflammation of the pericardium. In response to that, sometimes pericardium can get a chronic thickening. So what will happen if the pericardium get thick? It will get reduced distance, distensibility. It's very easy, like let's say if your heart is like this, there's the pericardium. When your heart try to relax, pericardium also needs to relax, right? But let's say your heart is trying to get relaxed, but pericardium is very thick and it's not, get, it's not relaxing. So that is what we call as constrictive pericarditis where it's become very thick and that result in decreased relaxation of the heart. Okay, and that patient will have abnormal diastolic feeling, giving you a diastolic heart failure feature. And the feature will be same like heart failure. If you do a X-ray, sometimes you get a egg shell appearance of the heart. Now, if you look at this arrow, you can see there is a like a whitish demarcation. That's demarcation is because of excess calcium deposition in the pericardium. And that calcium is looking like this eggshell appearance. And that's a classic picture for constrictive pericarditis. Okay. There is not much of a treatment. The treatment is about like, treating, the, treating the diastolic heart failure. All good? So that's all about this, the topics that you need to remember, especially for this cardiomyopathy, pericarditis, pericardial effusion, all of this. This is what you need to remember. You don't need to know any much than what you have learned so far. Okay, that's more than enough. Yes, in case of cardiac tamponade, initial investigation will be a bedside echocardiogram because it's urgent. And Dr. Aisharia, how does we manage fluid overload in diastolic heart failure if we don't use diuretics? Very good question. Now, most of the time, if you use calcium channel blocker and or beta blocker, your heart will be able to be able to get relaxed enough that it will not give you like congestion. Heart failure does not mean that it will always have to be congestion. Patient can get dyspnea, shortness of breath. Those can be there. Many times patient does not get like congestion all over the body. Some patient of heart failure will only present to you with dyspnea on exertion and fatigue. Okay. But if, if it becomes like, if the patient gets congested, then even with a diastolic heart failure, you will use diuretics. Now, moving on to another chapter called hypertension. So hypertension is chapter 86 in JM7 and chapter 77 in JM8 edition. So you will need to follow JM for hypertension. I have added the important thing from there. So all of us know what is hypertension, right? So hypertension means increased blood pressure. The optimal blood pressure is less than 120 by 80. The normal is, you can say, 140 by 80 is normal. According to JM, up to 139 systolic, to 89 diastolic is high normal. 
and normal is up to 129 systolic, up to 84 diastolic. Now, you don't need to memorize any of this. Just get an idea. So when it becomes hypertension, it means if the blood pressure is more than 140 by 90. So that becomes hypertension. There is grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3, mild, moderate, and severe hypertension. So severe one is important to remember, more than 180 by 110, any of these two. Like let's say someone has got systolic 160, but diastolic 110, will it be moderate or severe? It will be severe hypertension. Okay, so any of these two, if fulfills criteria, you will think about the next one. Same, if someone has got, let's say, 160 systolic heart, systolic blood pressure, and they have got diastolic 90, what will be your grading? Moderate. So it will be moderate hypertension. So any one is, is all right. So if you get only one systolic or diastolic elevation, that will be hypertension. Okay. Now it is recommended to check blood pressure for everyone who is older than 18 years of age every two yearly. So annual, the screening period for hypertension is from 18 years of age every two yearly. What are the causes of hypertension? Most of the time it is unknown. 90 to 95% cases, it's essential hypertension where you don't get any finding or any cause of it. Five to 10% cases, it can be due to some underlying cause. Like if kidney get any problem like glomerulonephritis, reflux nephropathy, very important is renal artery stenosis. Endocrine like Conn syndrome, Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytoma can cause it. If a patient on oral contraceptive, that can cause it. Coarctation of aorta, some of the medication, especially NSAID or a steroid can cause it. So remember the name of this cause because sometimes it comes in exam. The important clue to diagnosis of the secondary hypertension is important. Like when you think about renal artery stenosis, if in the stem, they say that patient has got a abdominal brewing or a renal brewing. So if it's a renal brewing, that's likely to be a renal artery stenosis. If patient having proteinuria, hematuria, RBC cast, likely to be glomerulonephritis. Patient has got kidney mass with or without hematuria, and maybe a little bit of family history of such condition, that's polycystic kidney disease. Delayed femoral pulse, or you can say radiofemoral delay, likely to be coarctation of aorta. Sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea itself can give you hypertension. Some recreational drugs can do it, like a stimulant, like amphetamine. We know about oral contraception, steroid can do it. Okay, so these are the main thing that you will be looking for. So you can see here that physical findings that may suggest secondary hypertension include epigastric bruit. The epigastric or renal bruit suggests kidney artery stenosis. Then if you get a abdominal or flank mass, suggests polycystic kidney, radiofemoral delay, coarctation of aorta, truncal obesity with pigment and stria. Cushing syndrome. So Cushing syndrome patient will have obesity, especially truncal obesity, moon, moon faces. Then they will have like easy bruise, bruising in the body, hyperglycemia, hypertension. They can get some pigmentation in their abdomen. So then you think about Cushing syndrome. Few chromocytoma, especially if a patient having sudden episodes of tachycardia or palpitation, sweating, flushing of the face, hypertension, headache, then we think about pheochromocytoma. So this will be the clue in the stem that will lead you to think about such of these secondary hypertension causes. Okay? Now, there are a couple of other diagnoses called malignant hypertension and refractory hypertension. 
Malignant hypertension, especially if a patient's diastolic BP becomes more than 120, and along with that, patient having some kidney or eye disorder. And refractory hypertension means high blood pressure despite giving maximum dose of two drugs for three to four months. So you tried two maximum dose of antihypertensive for three months, still patient's blood pressure is not going down. That is refractory hypertension, okay? Now coming to renal artery stenosis, Renal artery stenosis means that the if this is the aorta, that's your renal artery, and that's the kidney, let's say. Sometimes patient can have atherosclerosis and it can cause narrowing of this renal artery. And then there will be decreased blood supply to the kidney, and kidney will activate the renin angiotensin system and renin angiotensin system will cause retention of sodium and water. And because of that, you will get hypertension because you are retaining fluid with the salt. So that's the cause of hypertension. Now, if it's happening in a young female, it can be due to a condition called fibromuscular dysplasia, but it's mainly in young adult. Elderly or middle-aged, most likely atherosclerosis. How to diagnose it? Doppler ultrasound of the renal artery. Okay, so that's highly sensitive and specific. If a patient has renal artery stenosis, if it's just unilateral, the treatment of choice is ACE inhibitor or ARB. Only time we use ARB is if a patient is unable to tolerate ACE inhibitor for a very dry, irritating cough. You can use ARB if you want, but usually if someone cannot tolerate ACE inhibitor, then option will be changing it to ARBs. If it's a bilateral renal stenosis, then ACE inhibitor is not a good idea. Then calcium channel blocker will be your best choice. So remember these two because it comes in exam. Now, let's say you have found a patient and you found that patient's blood pressure is high in one setting. Can you diagnose that the patient, have got, patient has got hypertension? No. Single episodes of hypertension cannot confirm that. You need at least two separate visits showing patient having high blood pressure. Only that time you can confirm the diagnosis. So diagnosis should not be made on the basis of a single visit. Initial raised BP reading should be confirmed on at least two other visits within a space of three months. And if still blood pressure is high, then you can confirm. Now this is the follow-up criteria for hypertension. Important for your exam. So let's say it's less than 120 by 80. You just follow up every two yearly. If it is within the high normal range, then recheck in a year time with lifestyle advice. If it's grade one hypertension, confirm within two months and advise lifestyle modification. Grade two, it's better to evaluate the patient within a month and start with lifestyle advice Still after a month of lifestyle advice, patient blood pressure is high, you can start medication. So you can see that if you get hypertension, just don't immediately start blood pressure medication. Give the patient some time to do some lifestyle modification. Still after a month, blood pressure keeps high, then you can add a blood pressure medication. But the only time when you can start medication immediately is this grade three. Either you can further evaluate in a week time or immediately. So it's a good idea that if it's more than 180 by 110, 
this is start the mitigation okay but in other cases you can start with lifestyle modification first so that's what is written in here if mild hypertension is found observation with repeated measurement over three to six months should be followed before beginning therapy if a patient having initial diastolic bp more than 115 particularly if a patient having target organ damage like kidney failure heart failure or problem with the vision those kind of cases you should start the treatment immediately There is a term that you will come across in exam called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. What is this ambulatory BP monitor? Ambulatory BP monitor, it's a 24 hour blood pressure monitor. It is mainly done for patient who has fluctuating level of blood pressure. Let's say at home setting, patient blood pressure is 120 by 80. But when you check in your clinic, it's 160 by 100. So let's say fluctuating level. Patient can have white coat hypertension. Especially if you have a very unusual variation of blood pressure. If there is a marked discrepancy between home blood pressure and office blood pressure, or if a patient is having resistant to the drug, in those cases, do this 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. In this, case, in this case, patient will just put a device on their arm and that device will record his blood pressure over 24 hours time. And that will give us an idea that how is it at home, how is it when he is awake, how is it when he is asleep, okay? So white coat hypertension means that a lot of people get very anxious when they come to the clinic. But at home or in any, any relaxed environment, they, their blood pressure is totally fine. So that is what we call as white coat hypertension. So if a blood pressure is higher in GP setting and at home setting, patient's blood pressure is normal, that's what we will call as white coat hypertension. Now the management of hypertension, as I say that most of the time, initially you can just start the patient with a lifestyle modification for a, at least one to three months. The behavioral techniques that we advise, the best option is reduction of weight. Even with a, every one kilo body weight lost, blood pressure will drop by 2.5 millimeter systolic. So that's a good one. And apart from weight reduction, excessive alcohol intake should be reduced, reduction of sodium intake or salt intake, then some others like stress, smoking, all of the other things. Now, also one of the things that we use before starting antihypertensive treatment is called five-yearly cardiovascular risk assessment. Now, we know that if a patient is diagnosed to be hypertensive, everyone needs a lifestyle modification. When you are doing the lifestyle modification advice, assess the patient's five-yearly cardiovascular risk by that risk assessment chart that you guys, I think we, we have gone through that in our trial session. Once you do the five-yearly risk assessment, if it's low risk, then you can just continue with the lifestyle changes for six to 12 months. Even after a year of lifestyle modification, still blood pressure high, especially more than 150 by 95, then you can consider a treatment. For moderate risk, again, you can try lifestyle change for three to six months, but still after six months of lifestyle, patient blood pressure is high, you can start treatment. For high risk patient, or patient with target organ damage, begin drug treatment immediately. So for a high risk patient who have high blood pressure, it's not a bad idea to start the treatment immediately. High risk means that when you do a 
five yearly risk assessment, you will get the patient having more than 15% risk of heart problem. Okay, so that's usually a best idea that to how to start medication. Now, let's say you want, you are starting a medication for the patient. What is your first line medication? The first line medication is any of these three, ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, or low dose thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics is a good idea for more elderly patient above 65. Okay, but for middle age, like around 50, 55, ACE inhibitor will be your best choice to start with. So any of these three is fine. Now, how to follow up? Let's say you started a medication, then you will review the patient after three months, but it's still patient blood pressure is high, they can, then you can combine another medication. Like if you started with ACE inhibitor, you can combine calcium channel blocker with ACE inhibitor, or you can combine thiazide diuretics with ACE inhibitor. These are the mainly the two which is better. ACE inhibitor with beta blocker, not much, but if you don't have any option, then you can do it. Still after three months, blood pressure high, at three medication, ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker and thiazide. Still after that patient blood pressure is high, you can start the patient with a spiral lectern or send the patient to a cardiologist. So that's your option one by one, okay? The first ACE inhibitor or calcium channel blocker or thiazide diuretics, three months, no effect, combine the two, either ACE calcium or ACE thiazide. Still no effect, combine all the three. Still blood pressure high, add a spiral lactam. Okay, now some of the combination are, that, are not that much effective. Especially we don't use beta blocker, ACE inhibitor that much. We don't use diuretic and calcium channel blocker that much. But you should not give beta blocker and calcium channel blocker at the same time because both of them can lower down the heart rate and patient can end up having a heart block, okay? Try not to use a spironolactone with ACE inhibitor because it can increase the possibility of hyperkalemia. But many times we might need to Start it, but be, but be careful because both of them can increase potassium. And ACE inhibitor ARB also does the same thing. So you don't need to combine these two. Okay. The next thing is hypertensive emergency. Hypertensive emergency means if a blood pressure becomes really high, especially the patient who has a high blood pressure above 180 by 110, with that patient develops some, some features like hypertensive encephalopathy, like very confused, stroke, heart failure, dissection, all of these will be hypertensive emergencies. All of these patients will be referred to emergency department and the treatment will be like a very slow reduction of blood pressure. Usually you will go, you will try to lower down below 160 by 100, but don't drop the blood pressure too much. So just very slowly. And usual treatment is calcium channel blocker with a ACE inhibitor at that time. Okay, so for hypertensive emergency, initial treatment is usually the calcium channel blocker like amlodipine. Now, this chart is the most important chart from all the hypertension thing that we have discussed. Time to time, you will have to consider different kind of antihypertensive based on the patient's medical history. Like let's say a patient having asthma or COPD, for them, beta blocker is contraindicated. So you can use any of the other, like ACE inhibitor will be a good idea, calcium channel blocker, diuretics, any of this is fine but not beta blocker. Constipation, calcium channel is not a very good medication for someone who is struggling with constipation. For a patient who is already having heart block or bradycardia, don't give beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. For cardiac failure, 
calcium channel blocker is not usual medication, but best is ACE inhibitor or diuretics. For diabetes, because thiazide diuretics can cause hyperglycemia, usual, usually we don't do it. ACE inhibitor is a good medication for diabetic patient. Same with dyslipidemia or hyperuricemia patient. Thiazide diuretics is not a good medication for them. For peripheral vascular disease, the best medication is calcium channel blocker because it can cause vasodilation. And if you give beta blocker, it can cause vasospasm and it is contraindicated in PVD patient. Okay, same with Raynaud phenomenon, calcium channel blocker is good. For kidney failure, ACE inhibitor can be given as long as it's not more than it's just three heart kidney failure. So it's just three means if it is going less than 40, if like we would say like if it goes less than 30 GFR, ACE inhibitor will not be a good idea. At that time, choose from calcium channel blocker or diuretics. But let's say patient having a stage one kidney failure, ACE inhibitor is a good medication for that. Okay. So this is actually very important for your exam. Try to remember it. Now that brings us to the finishing of our tonight's session. There is only one chapter that we haven't touched that is called palpitation. You will get that chapter 70 in eighth edition. We will do that in our ECG class. ECG class is not part of the two weeks free session. So once you enroll the course, then we will have a ECG class. During the ECG class, you will get the palpitation chapter from there because Usually ECG and palpitation are the same thing. So we will discuss palpitation during our ECG session, okay? I hope that you guys enjoyed this class. Any question? No, in JM, there is no chapter for valvular disease or cardiomyopathy. This is from your Kepler. So how are you liking the sessions, guys? So I haven't got that much time to ask you. So you guys can open your microphone and talk to me. That's totally okay. And I will just allow that at the moment because our class is finished. So... You guys are liking the class so far. This is actually the usual pattern of the class. You will get a free session with Dr. Rabia, I think on 22nd. So that will be your next class on some recent question solvation class, right? So you'll see that how we take our question solvation class as well. So I hope that you are enjoying these sessions. Now you can see that like there is a, this time, I think this is the highest number of students we have got passed in November. So it's a huge number. So I'm still working on just writing some congratulations to them because it's a huge the time to write everything. So that's how our students are passing in the exam. And I hope that if you follow our guideline, this is a very doable exam. It's the main issue that happens that Candidates lose a lot of time with, first they start reading a book, then they start reading the whole book, waste their time. The guideline is really important, like at least understanding what is important for exam can make your preparation very, very short and concise and well organized. Otherwise, it will be all over the place. The book list has already been given in our Facebook course group. So all the books that you and anyone need for the exam, the book list has been already given. It's a huge number of books that you can read, but the main book is JM and Handbook. Okay, Kaplan Step to Seekers, you should have it because it 
as a very good explanation of many topics. So have that with you when you are reading JM. If you have these three, you are fine. Others are usually from some of the Australian website. So a lot of people will, will guide you like a lot of books, but those books are not updated and not needed for exam. The only book that you need is JM and handbook and also the Kaplan. This three is must. Others, you can just get it from Australian guideline like RACGP, RCH. Now, Dr. Naomi, you are already getting the classes. So these are classes of your course. Okay, so the class has been already started and the next schedule you will get once this schedule is finished. Okay. No, there is no class tomorrow. The class is on 22nd. But usually we take class on Wednesday. But Dr. Rabia had to cancel because of one of her, I think there is a hospital duty she has got suddenly. So we had to change it to 22nd. The next class will be with Dr. Rabia, where, where it is, there is no topic. It's actually random question solvation. And then there is another class with me, which is on 27th, where we will do cardiology question solvation. And the last class will be with Dr. Rabia again on 28th, which will be also a question solvation. So all of these will be question solvation class. There will be many more psychiatric class. So we just did one psychiatric class, but there will be another two to three psychiatric class in the course. Okay. Any question about the course? I think we, we have gone through the course quite a, quite a, quite a lot of time. Yes, the cardiology is finished. There is no other topic that you need. Just we, are, we haven't done with ECG and palpitation that will be done in the course. Yes, there is a cardiac mock exam in your portal. If you are part of the course and have got access to the portal, then yes, you will be able to do the cardiac mock test. Surgery and other subjects, I, as I say that we will cover everything. Now, obviously in two weeks, we can't cover everything. It's just the start of the of the classes, right? So this is a five months course where you will get everything that you need. So surgery, your psychiatry, pediatrics, everything will be discussed in the class, but not as a part of free session, obviously. So the course will be finished on, so if we have started on December. So, So usually at the end of April, it will be finished. Again, as I said initially, that if any of you get an exam date before end of the course, you can always ask us, to get into the previous batch recordings and we can allow you to go through those previous batch classes so that you can finish it in your own time. At least the theory session you can finish because theory sessions are, are almost same every time. So what you can do is that if you have got a placement for an exam, let's say in March or February, you just need to send classes together.
And Dr. Diva, you are part of the course, like you already made the payment. Yeah, all right. So, and you made an account in the software. Yeah, so just give me, just send a message in to us that you did, you made the payment, you also made an account in the software. Can, can you guys please approve my access? So if you just send a message like that, I will, our team will have a look. Okay, just send a message to, to my inbox. So I was saying, Dr. Ruha, is that if any of you have exam placement in February, March, or even April, because we will finish in April, and if you have exam in April, you will not get enough time to prepare. So for those candidates, we allow you to get into our previous batch. That means the batch that has been just finished. And it has all the theory, even some of the some of the questions solved class. So you can go through that batch recording classes and prepare yourself so that you don't need to just rely on finishing the course. So you can actually finish the course in your own time, even within two months, if you are very quick. And about the payment, payment can be done in our portal. So our portal is I will just give you the portal detail in here. So if you write first at amc.com, then you will get, a, get the portal. And if you go into the portal, you can make payment from there. So let me just do that in here. I'll just share my screen. And this is the portal. If you go to this portal, and you go for five months extensive MCQ course and click subscribe. If you go to this here, and if you click subscribe button, then they will take you to the first, they will take you to the some of the details, your name and all of the other details. And then the next phase, you will need to upload your photo. You will need to upload your MBBS certificate and then there will be a payment option, okay? So you can just pay, make the payment there. If it becomes very tricky for you and you, you're not able to do that, you can always send us a message or email and we can send a separate invoice to you, okay? And anyhow, you can make the payment in this way. But you will need to make, it, make an account in this portal anyway for accessing all the materials. So. It's, it's a good, it's not a bad idea to just to do it. And in our orientation session, we will go through everything, especially about how to proceed with the AMC, how to make an EPIC account and how to move to the verification of ECM, ECFMG. All of these things we will go through in our orientation session, okay? All right, so that should be all for tonight, guys. Hopefully you will enjoy the sessions for the next, next week. We have three more free sessions and I hope that you will enjoy that. The admission is going on at the moment. So still, if you, are, if you want to join, make sure you start the process because it takes a little bit time. So just make sure you start it. Okay, have a good night. Bye, thank you.